On July 20, 1969, the United States put man on the moon, and the Defense Intelligence Agency helped make that happen. There is little doubt that the Soviet Union did embark upon a bold venture to establish a list of key regime leaders who must be pursued and brought to justice. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. When DI came into existence in 1961, one of the first questions that we had to resolve was, were the Soviets looking at a space program or were they developing ballistic missiles with a, with a reach capability to hit the United States or was it both? We were the ones who functionally kept leadership in the United States government aware of where the Soviets stood in their own program and as a result of that we're able to allow our leadership to be informed in making their own decision about the way forward. The United States was lucky in the fact that we were able to bring uh, Dr. Werner von Braun, a key scientist who worked on the German V-2 rocket program, to the United States, and he became a truly instrumental figure in the development of the U.S. rocket program. At that point in time, uh, one of his first recruits to be able to help design the Saturn program was Mr. Douglas Elder, who turns out to be my father. In 1955, my dad launched the first rocket as a young kid and ultimately went on through high school to be able to develop wind tunnels and start doing his own rocket programs in the early 1960s. Dr. Werner von Braun recruited him from the National Science Fair to come work for NASA and help design the Saturn missile program. One of the great things that I found out just recently was that my father, when he was working on the Saturn program, was using DIA intelligence on Soviet missile programs to be able to help design the Saturn program, and he was getting that information from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Even though my own personal connection to the moon landing was through my father, because I wasn't born yet, many of our DIA employees actually have very strong reminiscences of that day. It was something personal to them and something that they'll never forget. So in uh, July in 1969, I was in Anchorage, Alaska. And I was at home in South London. I was in Southern Ontario, Canada. I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. I was in Hokitika in New Zealand. We were watching the dawn of a new age. We were watching things which uh, my father um, said, you know, you just dreamed of before World War II. It was science fiction. It really was science fiction. And then there would be things at school where the teachers would talk about it, then you'd go out at night and try and find a satellite in the sky. You sort of got a sense of space was something interesting. You watched the Jetsons as a kid. We had, you know, cool space toys like Major Matt Mason, where we had space stations and aliens and all sorts of little vehicles and things like that and you spent all day you know thinking about you know what it would be like living on a, another planet. I even had the Gemini capsule for my G.I. Joe which was pretty cool as well. It was just the single shuttle and you'd set the G.I. Joe in it and that's about all there was to it. It wasn't a whole rocket but you know it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I remember being both absolutely fascinated by the idea that this wasn't a cartoon, this wasn't Flash Gordon, this wasn't Star Trek, this was real guys doing real things. Everybody knew all the steps that the uh, command module and the lunar lander would have to take. We all knew when separation would occur. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Watching science fiction shows, we expected the lunar module to look more like a rocket and it looked more like this bug with weird antenna sticking out of it. My father was a quality assurance engineer for NASA in the early to mid 60s and used to bring home photographs from the Ranger program showing possible landing sites. When they got there, was it 
white like it looks when we see it. Uh, what were craters? Would they step in craters? Our company was called into a day of barracks, old wooden barracks, and we were split up and there were TV sets, one on each side, up, up high, black and white of course, grainy, and we're hot, kind of looking. Mike, and we understand that you are Doc. It wasn't just that we were watching, we knew the whole world was watching the same thing that we were, and it was an amazing feeling. And what was so impressive was just hearing these very calm voices counting down how they were going to land. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. Good. Picking up some dust. You talk about things that you do in your life that has a degree of risk, and for someone that's a novice, they may not necessarily appreciate that risk because they don't understand the science or everything that's behind it. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It is still an absolutely incredible thing 50 years later to look at it.